Hey, I'm Ryan, and welcome to The House. We are so glad that you've chosen to join us from all around the world. And we hope more than anything that you might find hope and life in learning about the person of Jesus. If you're looking for additional information about The House or just for more resources, you can find them online at thehouseonline.ca. Thanks for joining us today, and enjoy the service. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the house. If you're in the foyer, I invite you to come on in and uh, find a seat. Uh, my name is Josh. Uh, I'm a guest worship leader here, actually. I invite you to stand with me, and uh, we're going to magnify the name of Jesus together. Sing you stood.
Hey, well, good evening. Welcome to the house. It's so good to have you here with us tonight. We're glad that you found us even on a long weekend at the house. Uh, it's great that, that you could join us. We're so glad that you're here. If this is your first time here, we hope more than anything that you might feel at home, that you might feel like uh, it's okay to not be okay. Uh, and, and we just want to invite you along this journey because we're all here trying to figure out who, who is Jesus and why did his life make a difference to the way that you and I should live ours. I want to read to you out of a verse in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, and it says this, Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, the one who is raised and, at, as in, whew, and is at the right hand of God and who is interceding for us today. You see, Jesus is seated on the throne next to the Father. He is the King over all things. And yet I know for you and I, each and every one of us, we have things in our life that, that want to take the throne. We have, we have things in our life that, that we, whether we mean to or not, we make ultimate. And so tonight, what, what if we just said, hey, I'm going to dethrone those things and make, make some room for King Jesus to take his rightful place, to take the throne, to reign. So we're going to worship tonight. I want to encourage you, just, just be okay to not be okay. It's okay. We're, we're all human, okay? There's a lot of okays. I'm going to pray. It's going to be a great night. So excited to have my friend Josh here. Josh is on staff at Willow Park, and we've become great friends personally. But I just love that, that we can partner as the church in Kelowna and say, hey, we want to make Jesus great. That's what this is about. It's not about building a stinking church. That's dumb. We're here to make much of Jesus. So why don't you pray with me? Lord, so thankful, so thankful that you are the one who's building your church. You are the one who's seated at the right hand on the throne. Jesus, that you have gone before us and are interceding for us. Lord, that you are fighting our battles. God, that you've loved us through the person of Jesus better than we could ever imagine. So thank you. Thank you. We pray that tonight our praise would be a response to what you've done for us. Lord, we love you. Pray this in your name. Everyone said, amen.
sweetly speak to your own With patience you wait for your bride Our adulterous hearts leave your life for our time We forsake you knowing us And then I will learn to love From to leave out this haunting Hearts ready to run with the prodigal sons As you beckon us home for a feast Yeah, oh, chalice, so oh, chalice, so oh, chalice for us Chalice, so oh, chalice, so oh, chalice for us You pursue without rest You'll knock you up to your pride Yes. Yeah.
chalice for us. Chalice, yo, chalice, yo, chalice for us. Chalice, yo, chalice, yo, chalice for us. Chalice, yo, chalice, yo, chalice for us. Pursue without rest. Feel not you till your path is easy to Till your path is easy to
See, in the name of Jesus, there is all, all power, all authority, that in him and through him, all things are held together. And it is so beautiful. Saying, Jesus, we, we declare you make the darkness tremble. You silence all that fear. That is such good news. Some of you might know we've been working through a series on the life of David. And you know what I love about David? Is that the story of David is actually, uh, it's, it's the story of Jesus. It's the, it's the lead-in into the lineage of the person of Jesus. You see, the Lord knew David didn't, didn't have what it take, took. He, he couldn't be the ultimate king. He wasn't forever the one to reign. But he only foreshadowed the one who was to come, the person of Jesus. And you see, because of Jesus, you and I, we don't have to have it all together. We don't have to have it all figured out. Because in Jesus, the, the righteousness, his righteousness has been given to us through the cross. And that is such good news. And if you're anything like me, if you're anything like David, at times you don't feel like you have it together. You don't feel like you know enough. You go, God, why would you choose to use me? And I think David at times would have felt very much that way. So we're, we're going to sing a song. You know what? You guys can go ahead and grab a seat, actually. We, we're going to sing a song now. Um, and, and this is a song about David. Because David was a, just, just an average guy who God said, you know what? I am going to call you. I'm going to anoint you. And I'm going to use you, ultimately, to bring the person of Jesus in, into this world, to be a part of the lineage of Jesus. And there's so much hope in knowing that even someone as as spectacular, as uh, gifted, as famous as the person of David felt like, you know what, at times, I don't, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I understand. And so Josh is going to sing a song now, a song that he wrote, uh, and it's called Goliath. And, and it speaks to this. It speaks to Jesus is enough. Ah 
life's need swift to the turn of the day The lust of my flesh numbs my heart, numbs my soul, numbs my head The darkness is dancing, I can feel his eerie grin I'm sick and I'm twisted against you alone have I sinned And there's a crown is the last thing I ever thought would grace my brow I didn't want it back then I'm not sure I want it now Got no need to follow, to follow the footsteps of kings. I just want to tend pastures and kill giants with pebbles in slings. Oh. feel insufficient at the end of our ropes, um, fake, called to more than we can handle. Thank you that you see who says that your power is made perfect in our weakness. And our weakness means you can do something right. That you don't leave us with the hearts that we were born with, you make us new ones. We're just grateful. It's by your beautiful name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't we, I think that's worth a, a hey, thanks, Josh. <laughs> Woo! Josh and the team, man, what a beautiful time of worship. So good. So, so good. Well, hey, welcome again. My name's Ryan. If we, we didn't meet at the last intersection, uh, it's so good to have you here tonight. If this is your first time, we really hope that you uh, f- feel, feel welcome, feel comfortable, feel at home. Uh, we'd love for you to, after the service, head back to the coffee bar. I uh, see Catherine and her team. We'd love to give you a free drink and just say, hey, thanks for joining us. Good to have you. That's our gift to you. Uh, we're trying to bribe you so that you come back next week. No, I'm just kidding. But we want to say thanks. It's so good to have you. Um, Whether you have attended the house for six years, six months, or this is your first time, um, it's really important to us, and and we're passionate about uh, helping you take the next step. And here's what I mean by that. We think it's okay that you feel okay to come the way you are, but we don't think it's okay for you to stay the way that you are. Um, We we really believe that God has work to do in your life, and so we want to help you be able to take that next step in your your spiritual walk, in your journey with the Lord, uh, and with your your involvement in our community and and the life of the house. And so, and there are a few really, really simple ways that you can do that. want to make them known to you uh, so that you can know how you can get plugged in. So the first is uh, to to be a part of an affinity group. And affinity groups are vocational and interest-based groups that meet. Uh, You might not study the Bible, but you'll talk to people who are doing the 
the same thing as you with their life, maybe in the same area of business or work, uh, and, and really give you someone to lo- walk alongside with and, and do life with, create relationships and community. And so our, our, our next upcoming affinity group is a fine arts and, and, and art-based uh, affinity group that's this Friday. Um, the 17th, 7 p.m. meeting here at the house, and really is just a, a networking event, a way for you to come drink some good coffee and, and have some snacks and, and talk to people who are passionate about creating things and, uh, and, and network together. And that's this Friday. I'd love for you to come find life and find community in that. The second way that, that we make available or that we'd love for that to help you take the next step is through our growth tracks. And so um, we do Alpha every Wednesday. Alpha is almost done wrapping up. Do we have any Alpha people here? Hey, yeah, holler. That's awesome. Alpha's been so, so good. Had the privilege of doing it last semester. Love what God is doing through Alpha. Um, We're starting up a new series on the person of David. Uh, Very fitting as we work through David on our Sunday mornings and evenings. Uh, It's Tuesday night, 7 p.m. here at the house, and it's a table-based discussion again. You're going to get together with the same group of people every week, grow together, do life together, uh, and learn about the Bible and learn about David and, and how um, God, we can actually see some of our story in the story of David. Um, the third way that we would love for you to get involved and take the next step is to be a part of a serve team. And our serve teams are like the life and the heartbeat of the house. All the people who make things happen, who serve in the coffee shop and uh, in the tech world and uh, down here in the tech world and the shuttle bus and the greeting, all, all those different pieces, um, we... I really, really believe that you will find the most joy and experience the fullness of what God has for you when you are involved in serving his church with the gifts that he's given you. And so there's a multitude of ways that you can get plugged in and get involved uh, and just want to invite you into that. Um, One of those upcoming ways to do that is not this Monday, but the following Monday. Um, Once a month, we do our outreach. We call it House Helps, and it's just a way for us to give back to our community, to be a part of the greater community of Kelowna, go downtown, pray as we walk the streets, and just hand out hot chocolate or food and do something super practical and tangible for people that um, maybe don't have the same fortunes that we have. So uh, that's not this Monday, but the following Monday, meeting here at the house uh, around 6 o'clock. And so I want you to know lots of ways for you to intentionally take that next step within our community. And and more importantly, really, like whether you do it here or somewhere else, I mean, I'd love for you to do it here. I would. Um, But if if you're plugged in somewhere else, we just really want you to take your spiritual life, your journey and growth seriously, okay? That's enough of that. Lastly, if you want to be a part of giving at the house, worshiping financially, I want you to know lots of ways you can do that. You can do that online, through text giving, uh, at the donation station, under the Scrabble board. Um, We believe that there's so much joy in giving back to God what he's given us. He's blessed us so richly, uh, and every little bit makes a dent uh, in in the kingdom of God. And we just want to invite you to be a part of the missional community that the house is and and let you know that everything that you give really makes a difference. All righty. On that note, um, I'm making a difference. I want to draw attention. i got three girls, Stephanie, Tamara, and Ashley, who are going to join me here. And they have been making a dent in Tanzania. Uh, they've been overseas. Are we going to do this side tonight? Yeah. This is nice. Wow, we did, we did over here this morning, and so I'm feeling discombobulated. Um, they have been overseas. Uh, about a month and a half ago, they were in Tanzania for a month serving um, in both practical and, and spiritual ways. And really, really, really cool to see what God is doing through the, the tiny blimp of the house uh, across the world. And so uh, excited to have them share. Tamara, we're going to start with you. I would love for you to share a little bit about what you were doing uh, and, and some of the cool ways that you saw God show up. Thank you, Ryan. First and foremost, I really want to thank each and every one of you for financially supporting us, for prayerfully supporting us, even just listening and looking at our pictures. It meant the world to us, and we are truly so blessed to call you our church. I think there might be a video behind me. Okay, there's a video behind me to watch how we worship in Tanzania. Not too much different from what I You can join in. That's okay. You can join in right now. I mean, all of you, if, if you're feeling real bold. <laughs> Only if you start a conga line. <laughs> all right. Okay, now it's just repeating. 
So as you can tell, in Tanzania, they worship so freely because they understand what it means to truly trust God for something as simple as clean water, whereas we have that at the top, tip of our fingers in our sinks. So I'm not going to say too much about that. We were very, very blessed to spend two days in Arusha, one of the capitals, and we worked with Dr. Esther and her husband, Pastor oh, Limo. You can see up above us, we were quite a whirlwind at their church. We joined in in the dancing celebrations. Steph graced us with her beautiful singing. Ash, with her serving heart, was out there serving with everybody else. And I was preaching the message. I, I was able to preach a loving message on thanking God in the hard circumstances of life. And uh, one day you'll know why. <laughs> So uh, after our church, we actually went into the pastor's house where they have two girls that are working with them. And we were very blessed to meet this beautiful young lady named Nema. And Nema had escaped. Uh, she was raped twice. And she had escaped the Maasai and was in hiding. And she had such a hatred and a bitterness and just so much unforgiveness toward men. And God said, it's time, Tamara. So for the first time ever, I opened up publicly about when I was raped when I was 17. And we cried together, we shared together, and it was amazing because God used me to show her that even after something as tragic as being raped, you can love again, you can trust, and you can forgive the person that did that to you and pray for them. So that was very, very powerful for us. Uh, after, we went to a Maasai village, which is such an honor in itself. We were the second group of white people and females to ever go on the Maasai land. And these guys were very, very, very new to Christianity. So the fact that they even led us into their land was pretty amazing. They let us go into their boma, which is their house, and they let us pray over their house and their children. And if you notice in the picture, there's triplets. That in itself is one of the biggest miracles from God because normally they would sacrifice two of the children because only the firstborn is allowed to live. Uh, okay, next slide. Perfect. And this is where we did a lot of uh, ministry outreach as well. This is a different church. This one is in Marungu, and this is run by Pastor Deo, who became like a brother to us. We were able to bless the church by painting it inside and out, and we decorated it for them. And that was just one of the ways we could bless them. They allowed uh, Stephanie to sing for them, which was beautiful. And again, Ash was serving and teaching and loving. And of course, they voted on the island for me to do all the talking. Uh, I was able to share at one of their youth groups, and uh, I shared about just some other uh, struggles and tribulations I've been through. And it was definitely, I would say, one of the most amazing ways I have seen God turn pain into purpose misery into ministry and tests into testimony and I truly believe that it is through our greatest pain that we find the greatest gain in the Lord yeah it's great pretty cool to see how you know each of you with your unique experiences and, and giftings how God God really really practically used those Ash you're going to share a bit about uh, your work in a child care home and um, some of the work that you got to do as as a nurse uh, in, in a care center and what that looked like so why don't you talk to us a bit about that um, this trip was inc incredible, and I'm so um, grateful for all of you for praying because we, we really did feel it over there. Um, and we were very blessed to spend time with 33 little children where we stayed at an orphanage. And um, these 33 little people would bulldozer you when you walked in the door, hang off every limb, and it was like you were covered in sugar or something like that. As part of the children's school day, we got many opportunities to play with them and teach them. And um, I think we have a clip of them singing a video.
<laughs> I'm not sure if you understood that, but it was River of Life. Um, and it was a song that we taught them with hand actions. And it's quite incredible because English is not their first language and they memorized all of that. Um, they, we didn't write it down or anything. They're just like little sponges. They're so cute. It makes me smile seeing that video. <laughs> there behind me is um, some pictures of us with the kids. And you can see um, Tamara and Stephanie must have had sugar on their clothes because the kids are all over them. And um, the kids and me in a selfie and they know that word across the ocean. You can see they like making funny faces. Um, but it was so much um, fun spending time with them, um, whether we were singing with them, playing with them outside, whether they were showing us the farm animals, the chickens, cows, new puppies, new baby coat, goat, and we didn't get to see the new baby cow that was on the way. Um, but they welcomed us into their home and they thanked us for being so kind and coming to visit them when the experience they gave us was a gift. So we were very, very thankful. Um, we were also privileged to do um, home visits with Dr. Esther, where we visited the elderly and sick in their homes, the ones who couldn't come to a clinic. Um, and during the visits, we would check in with them and their family members to make sure they were doing okay. Our visits included a medical checkup, which I assisted with, and then also um, a spiritual checkup where we would pray um, that God would grant them comfort, healing, strength, whatever they needed. Um, and during one of our home visits, in a picture that you can see here, we... Um, we treated one of the um, elders, her granddaughter, who was also sick, and then we prayed and we were singing for the family. And as we did that, um, this gentleman that um, you see in the picture, he's a 70-year-old neighbor from somewhere around. He heard us and he came over and he asked um, if we could pray for him as he accepted Christ into his life. Um, and so it was just no words to describe that. It was praise God, you just never know when um, God's working. <laughs> Um, we also had the opportunity to work at a palliative care clinic, which is the second kind of um, thing that Dr. Esther does. And there is a lot of volunteers that run that clinic and also do the home visits in the house because, of course, Dr. Esther can't be everywhere at one time. And so you can see me here in this picture, and I'm teaching them how to do wound care. So I went over there and tried to do everything I could, try to teach them everything I knew. Um, and so the massage therapist, this, he's the one in the picture, he um, was getting his fake wound cleaned. But yeah, um, being the nurse, I did a lot of initial assessments with a translator. And then the girls um, helped with organizing the clinic and providing individual prayer, which was also very amazing. They've got amazing stories if you want to hear them. Um, but yeah, it was an incredible opportunity to serve. Yeah, so, so cool. I think what I heard from that too is that you'll need to sing louder when you're at home so your neighbors come over and ask them to lead, uh, ask you to lead them to Jesus. I think that's good, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Steph, you're going to share a little bit about uh, some of the challenges you guys faced while over in Africa. And I think it's really, really important to talk about these things because oftentimes we, uh, in, in church, we go, oh, here's all the mountaintop amazing things that God's doing. Uh, and, and we forget to look at those times where we really felt far from God or felt uh, weak. And, and God was actually so faithful to show up in those times and, and really make much of himself. So why don't you share a bit about that? Okay. Um... So the exhilarating thing about missions work is, of course, you get to see God work up close. But the challenging part is you see the devices of the enemy up close as well. While we were in Morongu, the cafe that Gospel Herald owned burned down and a man inside perished. There was a cult in town praying on the elderly, telling them they had to pay for prayer. We befriended a woman who had escaped from a murderous tribe and she had only managed to make it out with one of her two children. We saw innumerable afflictions, both physical and spiritual, and at times it was more than we could bear. Sometimes we were amazed that our new friends kept trusting the Lord, considering the trials that they had faced. Um, I'd like to show you a quick video of how we started and finished every day at the children's home together. So the lyrics there are Wani Ju of Yemabwana, which means you know me better than I know myself, Lord. Everyone from the youngest to the oldest would come together twice a day for worship, prayer, and scripture readings. There was prayer before every meal, prayer before leaving the house, prayer before making decisions, and even prayer before drinking a cup of coffee. The people we were with knew well that the Lord was their shelter from the storm and that coming into his presence was how their strength was renewed. We followed their example, and we prayed over the land that had burned. We held the hand of the woman who had been widowed. We showed a sweet old lady that she never had to pay for prayer, 
And we cried with the woman who didn't know if she would see her child again. So the lady in the next slide um, in the pile of kids is Catherine, my stepmom. She's in charge of Ubia Ministries, and she is always looking for people to sponsor children. Um, she'll take any amount of financial support that people have to give, and if you can't support financially, she will take you on as a prayer sponsor, which is super cool for you to consider. Um, most of these kids were abandoned or orphaned, and through sponsorship, you can give them what they long for most, which is relationship. So if you're at all interested, please do get in touch with her, and she'll get back to you right away. And thank you so much for being a part of this with us. Thank you, guys. Why don't we give these girls a hand? Man, so, so cool. I mean, you guys are on the ground. This was not just like a cushy VBS thing. There was, uh, you did real life with people, and that, that is so cool. Um, I also know that if I prayed before every cup of coffee I had, I'd be praying a lot more than I do. So I got, I got some work to do. <laughs> okay, I'm going to pray for you guys. Just uh, thank God for what he's done in and through you and what he's going to continue to do. So Lord, thankful, thankful that you um, call, that you equip, and that you send people. Um, Lord, we just pray that you would uh, just continue to bless those who, um, Steph and Tamara and Ashley, who they came into contact with in their trip. And we pray that you would bless these girls, that you would continue to work in and through them, even in their lives today as they go back into their ordinary jobs, their ordinary school, all of those things, Lord, that you would uh, just do extraordinary things through them. Lord, so thankful for how you work, and we need your help, we need your love, we need your presence. We praise you, thank you, we pray this in your name, and everyone said... Amen. All righty. Well, we're going to hand it over to Ed. Now that we've done the pre-sermon, uh, he's going to... No, you can take this one. It sounds better. Yeah. yeah. It'll make your voice sound sexier. I promise. Nathan said this one's going to die. Oh, he said... Okay. I'm, I'm wrong. Good evening, everybody. We are in a series um, called Unlikely Hero. And we are taking just, I think, about five weeks to look at the life of David. And hopefully, the, 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 through the series, our, our desire, our purpose is to um, awaken, inspire the hero inside of you. I think it's true for all of us that every now and then you see something in you, you see your own genius. You see something that stays dormant much of the time, maybe because fear you push it down, maybe because you just, you, you, you don't trust yourself, you're insecure. But every now and you see it. And that's the hero inside of you that I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will take his word and will wake that up and show you the significance of the callings and the purposes that God's put on your life. Um... I want to give you my sources for this talk. Uh, Gene Edwards wrote The Tale of Three Kings. Fantastic book. Uh, really inspired me a lot as we, that's been, I've been pulling from that for all, all the talks on this series. Timothy Keller, can't beat Timothy Keller. And then Stephen Furtick did an entire series on the life of David. And so I jacked some of his stuff as well um, for this talk. So there you go. Those are my footnotes. Um, I want to end up in 1 Samuel 19, but we're going to start in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, okay? And the, the, the talk is really about the tenuous relationship that David has with King Saul. And I really like this because we all have people in our lives that are, our lives that are just pure annoying. There are, they, we, we, we all have those people that they just rub us. We, we don't do well with them, and yet we can't get rid of them. And sometimes I think God brings sandpaper into your life on purpose because he has things that he wants to refine in you. And so that's what we see happening in the life of David. Samuel 16, verse 13. So Samuel took the horn of oil. Samuel's the prophet, right? Took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. 
Now the spirit of the Lord, in verse 14, had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Theologically, put that verse in your pipe and smoke it. All right, that one is just loaded, okay? I'm not even going to touch it. <clears throat> what I want you to see, though, is that verse 13 says that David gets anointed with oil and the spirit of the Lord comes on him powerfully for the rest of his life. And at the very same time, one verse later, the spirit of God, the anointing is taken away from Saul. And in this moment, there is a, at least at the beginning an unseen tension between these two characters in this narrative. But it's a significant tension. Anointing is powerful. You, when, when you see someone, like I was watching Josh, that was such a good song. You could just lose yourself in that song. When you watch him do what he does, see, he's anointed to do that. And when he's doing what he's anointed to do, he actually looks better than he really does. <laughs> he sounds better than he really is. Because when you're in your anointing, you, you know, there, there's authority, there's power, there's beauty, there's poetry. It's even true if you're a tradesman. I, I've watched carpenters, I think finishing carpenters are geniuses. Because I can't build a blessed thing. I have my father's gift in construction. And my father built the ugliest, most unstable barns you have ever seen in your life. That's what it looks like when I try to build anything. And so when I get to watch a finishing carpenter do what they do, man, it is beautiful. When a dancer that's called to dance dances, God gets glory, whether they're a Christian or not. When you do what God's ordained you and anointed you to do, there's power, there's authority, there's inspiration, there's creativity. But Saul, he lost the anointing. And when without the anointing, you just go through the motions. You can say the exact same things that you said when you were anointed. And, and, and the words fall off the end of the table by the time they come out of your mouth. Without the anointing, there's no inspiration. Without the anointing, there's no one following you. In the 80s, I'm from Calgary, and in the 80s, the charismatic movement swept through our city. And in particular, there was one little church, and I think they had like 30 people, seriously. And the Spirit of God landed on that church. And that little church began to grow and began to move, and within the space of less than five years, they, they had so exploded they were done running three services with a thousand people in each service. Services with a thousand people in each. I had the privilege of being on staff at that church. It's first job I ever had as a youth pastor, and the presence of God was on everything. I mean, they built a brand new building and all, but the spirit of God was on the worship. Spirit of God was on the preaching. Our youth man, we had twelve hundred kids in our youth group. It's like you couldn't do anything wrong. The Spirit of God took one word, multiplied it, magnified it. The anointing was so strong. In that church, we, we had a little gal. Her name was Danielle. She was part of our congregation for many years. She, she was in a car accident, but she was a paraplegic for seven years. And we had a guy, well, they, we brought him in from L.A. or something, and he had this incredible prophetic gift. He was a musician. He would sit down at the piano. And you know how sometimes you're in services and somebody will have a, you know, pull somebody out and say, I think this is a word for you. Well, this guy, Rich Cook, he would, he would call people to the front and then he would wash over them with a song. Then he would write these songs while he's at the piano and he would sing these songs over them. And he asked Danielle to roll her chair down to the front of the church. And he began to sing a song over her that had us all weeping. It was, it was that anointed. It was that powerful, that engaging. And, and, and she felt the presence of God profoundly, powerfully. That night, 
in the middle of the night, Danielle got thirsty. And she went to the fridge to get something to drink. And when she opened the door of the fridge and a light came on, she saw that she had walked to the fridge. She could walk. God healed her that night. That is the anointing. That is power. That is authority. All right? Now, in my third year at this church, I remember for all the time I was there, I, sometimes I'd, I'd cut through the sanctuary to get to my office and was always aware of the presence of God. Always sensed something, something rich and thick in the room, even if there was nobody in there. And in my third year there, I remember walking through the sanctuary and I stopped. I just stopped because it was gone. It had lifted. Something changed. I didn't know it at the time, but, but there were things going on in the leadership that were unethical. There was things, there's all kind of schmutz in the closets of some of the pastors. And the Spirit of God lifted. And within three years, three years, how do you shrink a church from 3,000 back to 30 in three years? You know how you do it? You take the anointing of God out of there. You take the presence of God out of there. And people, nobody's following, nobody's inspired, nobody's listening. The preacher's preaching the same words, but there's no authority on them. The music's the same, but there's no authority on it. That's what Fifteen years of David's life. All right. First Samuel sixteen, verse fifteen. Saul's attendants said to him, "See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servant here to search for someone who can play the lyre or the harp, just so you know. And he'll play when the evil spirit from God comes on you." And you'll feel better. And so Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. Now think about this. They have the entire nation to find a musician. Surely there were thousands of musicians in the nation of Israel at this time. What are the chances that one of his servants says to him, I have seen the son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He's a brave man, a warrior. He speaks well. He's fine looking man. And the Lord's with him. Oh, give me a break. Seriously? He's a brave man. He's a warrior. He speaks well. He's good looking. Like you think you could give any more to one guy? Really spread it out a little bit. Why couldn't he be ugly? You know what? Yeah, he can play, but he, but he, he stutters. It's just something. Like, well, why give all of that to him? I don't know where I'm going with that. Um, I have issues. <laughs> Psalm 16, 21. David came to Saul and entered into his service. And Saul liked him very much. And David became one of his armor bearers. And Saul sent word to Jesse saying, Allow David to remain in my service for I am pleased with him. And whenever the spirit of God came on Saul, David would take up his lyre and play and relief would come to Saul and he'd feel better and the evil spirit would leave him. Now what in the world is this all about? Is this fair? This isn't fair. Why would God do such a thing? He knows that this relationship is going to end badly. In fact, it's going to be an absolute disaster. It's one thing to have a stressful, difficult relationship with somebody else in Kelowna. And all you worry about is bumping into them at Costco. That's the only thing you have to worry about. It is completely another thing to have a stressful relationship with somebody in your own living room who lives there and you see them every day. David moved into Saul's house with him. Nothing but trouble could come of this. And yet God is the one who arranged it. 
Why? Why is God doing this? Psalm 47 says that God is our refuge and strength and very present help in trouble. Do you notice that the verse does not say that God is our very present help from trouble? He doesn't say that that God is our refuge from trouble, but in trouble. There are times when you think that you are in trouble because your life is uncomfortable, but you're not in trouble, you're in training. And God is putting David real close to Saul, right up tight, because that's where it's the hottest. That's where the crucible will burn the hottest because God, what David thinks is trouble, God sees as training. And a lot of us think that when David finished killing Goliath, I don't know, what do you think he did? After he killed Goliath, what did he, sign some posters? You know, go on a tour? Uh, you know, would he just, just bask in the glory of being a giant killer? It, it, what, that's not at all what he did. You know what he did? He got busy. Because Saul was smart. And when he's got a giant killer in his arsenal, he's going to use him. And he enlists David in the army. And the Bible says in Psalm 18, verse 5, whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that, God, that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all of the troops and Saul's officers as well. Can you see how because of this anointing that is growing, anointings grow, they start somewhere, but they keep picking up. Because of this anointing that's growing on David, he is mighty in battle. He's smart in battle. He's strategic in battle. And, 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 and he keeps getting promoted in the army. And, and not only is he smart, smart and strong and strategic, but God's favor is going in front of him, behind him, all around. Everybody loves this guy because of God's favor and God's anointing on his life. And when the men were returning home, after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. As they sang, as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And the Bible says, and Saul was very angry. I guess. What? They give me thousands. They give him ten thousands. I'm the king. I've been doing battle before he was born. I'm the king. The next thing you go, they're going to want to make him the king. And the Bible says, and so Saul kept a jealous eye on David from that point. All right? And this brings us to 1 Samuel 19. And this is where I really want to land. Verse 8 says, war broke out again. And after that, David led his troops against the Philistines. He attacked them with such fury that they all ran away. Do you know what David's reward was for killing Goliath? <laughs> I think, I'm thinking gelato. Um, uh, do, 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 do you want to know what God's reward, what David's reward was for killing Goliath? More battles. His reward for killing Goliath was that, that he was to use his sling and his strength and his courage and, and, and his anointing in battle again and again and again until he became utterly proficient in battle. Do you want to know what your reward for killing, for slaying the giant that you are staring into right now is? Your reward is the strength and the wisdom and the testimony that you took that one down and it gives you the courage and the strength to take the next battle and fight the next battle after that and fight the next battle after that until you become proficient in battle. Because most of you are babies when it comes to battle. As soon as life gets uncomfortable, you, you wonder why God has left you. You wonder why your life sucks, why your phone is so slow. God, have I sinned against you? What is wrong? The universe is imploding on me. I can't get cell service. <laughs> and God wants to get you to the place where you step into battle and you just go bring it on. 
the same God that rescued me from the last one is going to rescue me from you. Bring it on. You don't get so surprised when, when the wheels come off your wagon. You just go, bring it on. David didn't have any problem, it would appear, fighting battles. He was good with a sword. He was good with a sling. He was good in battle. He had a level head. But the biggest battles that David would fight in his life, maybe the most significant, were the ones that were inside of him. And I want you to see something. In Samuel 19.9, there's a different battle that's waging. Because the favor and the anointing and the spirit and the strength of God is undeniably increasing in David's life. And everybody around it could see it. The soldiers see it. The officers see it. The people see it to the point where he becomes the hope for the nation of Israel. And at the exact same time, the presence of God, the spirit of God, the anointing of God, the strength of God are undeniably being pulled away from Saul. Everything is slipping through his fingers. His kingdom is slipping through his fingers. And even when he tries to have David killed time and time again, it just turns out to promote David. And the people love him all the more. And then to make matters worse, David's the only musician that brings relief to Saul's torment. He needs him, but he hates him. He hates him, but he needs him. He hates him, but he hates him, but he needs him. He is stuck there. What a terrible predicament they're in. And finally, the tension in their relationship detonates. And listen to this. Saul was sitting at home with spear in hand. Really? Sitting at home with spear in hand. What are you doing? How many of you watch TV with a loaded shotgun on your lap? Just because you can. Like, who does that? This guy is getting, he's becoming unwound. It says, and Saul's sitting at home with a spear in his hand. What are you going to do with that? Then a tormenting spirit from the Lord suddenly came upon him as David played his harp. I'm thinking, what is David thinking? He's playing his tunes, and this guy's about to have a psychotic episode with a weapon in his hand. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. You know, just play. It's kind of like a bar band. You just play. If there's a fight, you just play. You just keep playing. Just keep playing. Just do it, you know. And and. And Saul hurled the spear at David. But David dodged out of the way, leaving the spear stuck in the wall. He fled and he escaped into the night. Now think about this. There are two men in the room. The crazy one's got his hand on his spear. And the other one's got his hand on his harp. In a game of rock, paper, scissors, spears, spears always win. Spears always win. In so many ways, this, 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 this is really, there's no winning for David. Saul's got his hand on his spear. David's got his hand on his harp. Saul is tormented. I mean, this guy is a walking civil war. He is at war with himself. And he's trying to kill David to silence the ongoing war inside of him. I want to be David. We all want to be David, right? I mean, the guy is just pure sexy. Who doesn't want to be David? You know what? He's got a heart after God. He's a warrior and all that other stuff. We all want to be David. But I gotta be honest with you. If I look real close, and I don't even have to look that close, I'm a lot more like Saul than I care to admit. I'm a lot more like Saul than I care to admit. Because I project my junk on the people around me all the time. You got stuff going on inside of you, so you kick the cat. You yell at the Prius that's going too slow. You, 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 you just, you just, you just, you just got it. You're just angry. And, and, and you know what? Hurt, hurt my feelings, make me feel bad, and I promise you, I, will, I got my hand on a spear 
constantly ready to defend myself. I'm good with words, which means I can be incredibly damaging with those same words. My hand is on the spear. I'll get you. Yeah, go ahead. Take a shot. I'll get you. And Saul's declared war on David. David can turn around, take the spear out of the wall. And one thing we know about David, that when he aims at something, he hits it. He, is, he, he could mess Saul up. He could pin him to the wall. He could pull the spear out and throw it at him. But David does something that is so, that is so contrary to, to his nature, so contrary to even his anointing for battle. David does something that is unthinkable at this moment. He does nothing. He doesn't take his hand off the harp. He doesn't defend himself. He doesn't take his hand off the harp because he sees somehow by faith that there's another hand in the room. One hand is on the spear. One hand is on the harp. And there's another hand on the room, in the room rather. In verse, in, in chapter 17, David says to, to Saul, when Saul says, you're too little to go fight the giant. David says, you know, God rescued me from a, a, a lion. God rescued me from a bear. And God is going to rescue me from the giant. And here in Samuel 19, David is, you can hear him rehearsing this in his mind. The God who rescued me from the lion and the bear and the giant and the countless battles that I've fought since then will rescue me from a crazy king, from a crazy king. You know how I know that that's what he was rehearsing in his heart? That's what he was rehearsing, rehearsing in his mind? Because the, the historical context for Psalm 59 is this moment right here. And in Psalm 59, David says this, you are my strength. I wait for you to rescue me, O God. You are my fortress. God, you will stand with me. And he says, oh God, you are my shield. There is a hand in the room. And David trusts in the hand in the room. And so he doesn't even bother to take his hand off of his own harp. Some of you know what it's like to have a spear sticking in the wall right by your head. Because you've been the target of criticism. You've been the target of gossip. You've been the target and you've, you've been misunderstood. And people are saying things about you. And people are hurting you. And you know what it's like. And everything inside of you wants you to pull, those, pull the spear out of the wall and send it back where it came from. Others of you in this room, you're just really good at throwing spears. Your mouth is a problem. You, you get a little bit hurt and all of a sudden you're telling the whole world your side of the story and you're hucking spears and you spend so much time hurling spears you don't realize that you're doing it out of a toxic, broken, wounded heart. And David understood that he had to fight this battle inside of himself. He understood that the war that's going on inside of him and the weapons to fight that war, he gives them to us in Psalm 59. He said, Father, I don't need to pick up a spear because you are my shield. Father, I, I'm, I, I know that Saul's got issues, but I don't need to fight this. I'm going to keep my hand on what you gave me to do because the Lord's going to fight my battles. And I would say to you, if people are throwing stones at you and rocks at you and spears at you, just keep your hand on what God's called you to do and the Lord will fight your battle. No weapon formed against you will prosper. You see, Saul cannot kill what God has ordained. God cannot, Saul cannot kill what God has anointed. He cannot. And somehow David rests in, in that. I'm going to invite um, the band to come on up. I'm going to land here. Ryan mentioned it at the beginning of the, our time tonight. David was not the only great king to come out of Bethlehem. In fact, in so many ways, he's just this very kind of a vague foreshadow of the king of kings, 
of the King of Kings that would that would that would come and and give us ultimate victory. Paul said this. He said, "The Spirit who raised Christ from the dead lives in you." You know, David, he got oil poured on his head and the spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. Well, guess what? Jesus died. So the spirit of the same spirit that raised him from the dead could be poured onto you. The same anointing, the same power, the same presence to be poured all over you. You know why? So that you don't fight for victory, you fight from victory. And when you're fighting from victory, you're fighting from peace. You're fighting from rest. You only get peace in your heart if you don't let go of the harp, let go of what God called you to do, the thing he's given you to set your hand to. I like this talk. This is a good talk. Because you know something? I, we all get trapped in it. He said, she said, you said. And we're just hucking spears at each other. And the one thing that God needed was a king who could, who could keep his own heart centered and straight. And God knew if he could find a king like that, that God could lead a nation. And I wonder if the very thing, the training that you're in the middle of is about getting your heart centered, taking your eyes off the offense, taking your eyes off of the criticism, taking your eyes off of that person. And for some of us, it's putting down the spear. It's just resisting the temptation to just nail them, put them to the wall. And saying, Father, even if I do that, my heart is still going to be so warped, so upset, so confused, so distressed. I'm going to start looking like a crazy king if I don't put the spear down. I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray for me. And ask God that we might actually become like David. You see, David, Saul, he amps it up, by the way. It goes from from Saul trying to kill David to then he sends his whole army out for years to try to kill David. So I don't know how much you dislike your mother-in-law, but I don't think she has access to an army, okay? And on many occasions, David had the opportunity to take Saul's life, but he refused to pick up a spear. Is the kind of king that, you, that God could use. So, Father, you see our hearts. They're deceitful and wicked. Who can know them? But, Father, we surrender our spears. As Holy Spirit, as you convict, as you touch our hearts, Lord, we surrender our spear. We put it down. Father, there are some that are really discouraged because people have been taking shots at them. They've been criticized. They've been, they've been hurt. And I pray, Father, that today that you would come with your, 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 your word and, and give them courage to just continue to walk in the things that they know they should walk in. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit, we would make room in our lives for your presence that raised Christ from the dead to to mightily come upon us. To mightily come upon us. And that we would find your callings and the anointing that you've set us apart for. And we live large in those things. In Jesus' name.
is my shepherd won't be wanting won't be wanting he makes me rise and feels free with quiet
Follow me, follow me in the house of God forever. In the house of God. Amen. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing your evening with us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for working in our hearts. Um, Rosemary and Dustin are going to be up here. Beautiful prayer ministry. Man, if you came and your heart's heavy, they'll uh, just don't miss the opportunity to allow them to minister to you. Also, let you know the student lounge will not be open this week. We'll boot up again next week. God bless you. Thank you again for coming. Have an awesome, awesome week, and we look forward to seeing you again. Good night.